Hello and welcome back. Today in calculus, we will be discussing what is known as the first fundamental theorem of calculus. So this is the big part that is going to lead into the second semester of, uh, you know, your, uh, I guess, calculus stage. Uh, the first semester is basically all the stuff that you did with the derivative. And then now the second semester, we're going to introduce what you can do uh, with this area under the curve thing and how does it relate to the derivative. All right, so here we go. Uh, so the first fundamental theorem of calculus is what we're going to be talking talking about. What I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to go ahead and give you the following problem so then that way you can kind of use it as an analogy to uh, conclude how the first fundamental theorem of calculus works. So uh, here what is happening is given the following tabular chart for the equation r of t where r of t is the rate at which a tub is filled uh, or which is being filled at t is equal to t, uh, t minutes and it's in terms of gallons per minute so sorry about the uh, English part uh, but yes r of t represents how fast the tub is being filled at that instantaneous time. So it's going to be a rate uh, equation. Assume that the tub contains 10 gallons of water to begin with. So that is just kind of like information that I'm giving you uh, for everything that we're going to need for this problem for the time being. Okay, good. So um, here underneath, you can see the chart right there. Uh, and you'll notice that uh, we don't have an equation to work with, but instead we just have some numerical values. Um, so here are some of the stuff that we can solve for according to what we did within the last couple of sections. Uh, we can solve for the area under the curve from 0 to 15 of r of t dt. So uh, in terms of how we solve for it, we have a few things that we can use. We can use the left-hand rule. We can use the right-hand rule. We can use the midpoint rule or the trapezoidal rule. But nonetheless, you know, there are basically many ways that you can find the area on the curve. So uh, in this case, what I did was I used the left-hand rule just as an example. So the first part, 3 times 3, because the first interval from 0 to 3, uh, you're using the height that's on the left-hand side. The a base length is 3, and then the height is 3. So that's where that first part comes from. Then for the second part, uh, this time, I'm going to go ahead and go from 3 to 6, and then the height there is going to be 5. So that's why it's going to be 3 times 5 then. Uh, next after that, we're going to go ahead and look at the next interval from 6 to 8, and then uh, the base length is going to be 2, and then the height is going to be 4. So that's where the 2 times 4 comes from. Then the next one is going to be 3 times 1 because from 8 to 11 and then multiply by 1 to the left hand side. Uh, and then 4 times 0 and then 2 times 2 just corresponding to uh, the size of the rectangles of each case is then. Okay. Uh, then you're going to add them all up because those are the areas of each of the rectangles. And what we have here is going to be 39 numerically. And in terms of what are the uh, what's the unit, just to kind of help you see it, um, let's just go ahead and maybe draw like a generic example over here on the side. Um, we have time, which is in terms of minutes. Right, And then we have uh, y, which is going to be r of t, and that's in terms of gallons per minute. And what I just did was I found the area under the curve using rectangles. So another way of seeing it is basically the area is equal to base times height. Well, the base is going to be time multiplied by the height, which is in terms of gallons per, uh, gallons per minute. Uh, and that time is in terms of minutes, sorry, forgot about that. So you can see that the minutes are going to cancel out, leaving us with gallons. And that's going to be the unit of our answer. So the answer is going to be 39 gallons. And in terms of what that represents, it's going to represent the amount of water that's entering the tub from t is equal to 0 all the way to t is equal to 15. Because your lower bound is 0 and then your upper bound is 15 then. All right, so that is the geometrical representation of for the uh, for the integral in this problem. Okay, now uh, let's go ahead and implement the following in there. What if I said, hey, take that answer that you just got and add ten to it? Well, numerically, the answer is forty nine gallons, which is um, hopefully you know you can understand that part. Forty nine actually the numerical value, but the representation now is that this represents the total amount of water that's in the tub. Because if you remember, going back to the very beginning over here, right, we said that you have uh, 10 gallons of water in the tub to begin with. So if you put in 39 gallons from 0 to 15, the time, and then you add another 10, then the total is going to be 49 then. Right. So that right there is just kind of like one way we can use the area under the curve uh, as a modeling problem. Now what I want to do is uh, I want to look at this a little bit more carefully. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and say the following. I'm going to go ahead and say let r of x is equal to the integral from a to x of r of t dt. 
So just referring back to the same problem, um, I'm going to go ahead and say that R of T, the lower case, is still that rate equation. And capital R, right, is going to represent then uh, the area under the curve for the lower case R. So the capital R of X, if you just going by the uh, example that I gave you, uh, means the following then. R of X, the capital R of X, is equal to the total amount of water that entered the tub from time T is equal to A to time T, which is equal to X. So, you know, just going back to our uh, uh, previous example, that's exactly what happened. Now, uh, the thing is, in this case, R of X, so that means X is a variable. Uh, so that means that time is going to be our variable in this case. And A is going to be a fixed time at which we're going to start pouring the water. So it's going to be from time A all the way to some time, uh, some arbitrary time in the near future. So that's where X is going to come in. So keep in mind right here, the two things that you need to know that is going to make us uh, allow us to transition is that X is going to be our variable. And yes, it is still in terms of times. So that means that X is going to be a uh, unit uh, in minutes. OK, uh, and then whereas R of X right there is going to be in terms of gallons. So here is the big conclusion as to what I really want. Now that we know that capital R of X is equal to that integral, what I want to do is I want to know what is R prime of X equal to, because remember, capital R of X is a function, so I can take its derivative. So here I want to take the derivative with respect to time. So that means it's like saying D DX of uh, R of X, okay? Now, if you're taking the derivative, just thinking back to first derivative, uh, first semester, it means to find the instantaneous rate at uh, which uh, the slope is going to be. So in this case, uh, what I'm saying is that, hey, R of X is in terms of gallon, X is in terms of minutes. So then that means that R prime of X, that should be in terms of gallons per minute because we're taking the derivative of a function with respect to time for uh, that is uh, where the unit is in terms of gallon. And in addition to that, it's at an instantaneous time. So the way I see it is that if I ask you for what is R prime of X, capital R prime of X, that is going to be equal to the lowercase R of X. Okay, so it's going to be lowercase R of X. So for example, uh, going back to over here, right? Uh, you'll notice that my, uh, uh, what was that called? Uh, for this example over here, if I say, hey, um, capital R of X is equal to zero to X of R of T dt, right? If I ask you to solve for what is R prime of 15, Okay, then that means, well, first of all, think about the units. Um, your unit for the integral, that is going to be in terms of gallons, right? So if I ask you to take the derivative, then that means a unit should be in terms of gallons per minute. And at what specific time? When time is equal to 15. So then that means that my answer is going to be 2 right there because that's the instantaneous rate at which the, uh, the, um, uh, the, the graph is changing at that time. So uh, now that actually is a really, really big thing because here is what we're going to get then as a result. If I put it all together so you can see what's actually happening, right? Uh, we say that R of X is equal to the integral from A to X of R of T dt. According to what we just said, then R prime of X is equal to uh, lowercase R of X. So what that means is, if I take the derivative, right, if I take the derivative of a function that has an integral in it, then that means we're going to go back into the original function. So if you want to kind of make this a little bit easier in terms of analogy, it's kind of like saying that the integral and the derivative cancels each other out. Uh, kind of like how addition and subtraction cancels each other out, or multiplication and division cancels each other out, log and anti-log cancels each other out, okay? So we've basically found something that, un that is going to undo um, the integral, which is the, the derivative, okay? And that right there is going to be our first fundamental theorem of calculus then, okay? So FTC1, that's basically what it says. So just to write it one more time, if R of X is equal to the integral from A to X 
of, uh, let's, let's just go ahead and say lowercase t dt, then that means that r prime of x is equal to just r of x, the lowercase. So this right here is ftc number one. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and see how this applies to what we're doing. And then this is going to be, uh, this is going to be kind of like the first half of how we're going to actually solve for the actual area under the curve then. Okay, so here we go. Uh, what is this weird thing on the side? Hopefully it's gone when I click it. Uh, well, it's still there. So we'll just go ahead and work with it. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and... Oh, actually, I don't like that because um, I don't actually want that to be there. Well, whatever. We'll just go ahead and work with what we have. Okay, um, so the first problem right here, uh, if you see on the left-hand side, I'm going to give you... Uh, actually, let's go ahead and give you something simple first to work off of, okay? Um, let's say that we have uh, S of T is equal to, oops, sorry, not S of T, okay? Uh, let's go ahead and say S of X, I think that's a little bit better, is equal to the area under the curve from 3 uh, to X of sine of T dt, okay? So that's good. this is going to be like a very simple example. Um, I want to take the derivative of this equation, okay? I want to take the derivative of this equation. So I want to know what s prime of x is equal to. So if I take the derivative of both sides with respect to x, like this, then according to the first fundamental theorem of calculus, the derivative and the integral are going to cancel each other out. So then the answer is just plain old sine of x then. Okay, all you're really doing is saying, hey, these two right here, they're going to cancel each other out. And whatever variable x right here that I have, we're going to go ahead and substitute that into our quote unquote dummy variable, which is t in this case. Okay, yes, t is actually called a dummy variable for this situation. All right, let's take another example. Uh, let's say this time we have uh, the following. Let's say that we have um, h of x is equal to uh, the integral from uh, negative 2 to x of e to the uh, sine of t dt, okay? So h prime of x, its derivative. Now, cutting the middle, man, if you don't need to see that, remember what I said. The integral and the derivative cancels each other out. So... All we have in the very end, if we're just looking at the very end, is just e mult, uh, to the power of sine of x, and then that's it. And that's going to be our derivative then. Okay? So that is basically your first fundamental theorem of calculus. Now, let's go ahead and apply this uh, to something that's a little bit harder so you can see how this actually works out. So let's say this time we have m of x is equal to... Uh, the integral, the area under the curve, from 3 to e to the x of sine of t dt, okay? Now, note that my upper part is no longer just x, but rather, it's going to be some function, right? It's no longer just uh, plain old simple x. It's like e to the x. So here's how I can see it. Well, if you recall, right, uh, s of x is equal to the integral from 3 to x of sine of t dt. So what I have on the right-hand side, this is like saying s of e to the x, right? Replacing in my equation of, x of uh, s of x with e to the x. That's basically the same thing. So that is going to be my representation for m of x. Now, supposedly I want to take its derivative, so m prime of x, that is equal to... Well, the derivative of the right-hand side, now this is where you have to go back to uh, first semester, and hopefully you didn't forget. If I take the derivative of s, right, then it's going to be s prime of e to the x, but multiply by e to the x because of the chain rule. So that part appears because of the chain rule, okay? Because the inner function is e to the x, so that's why I'm multiplying by, okay? Well, uh, then that means now uh, replacing things with what they're supposed to be e to the x is just there. s prime of e to the x, well, s prime, well, that's the same thing as what we've been doing so far. Remember, uh, we're taking the derivative of both sides, the integral and the derivative cancel each other out. So this s prime of e to the x, that is just s, uh, sorry, no, sine of e to the x. Okay? Because that is supposed to be my derivative with e to the x plugged in. All right? Um, let's go ahead and see how we can actually make this a little bit easier for us because, you know, that seems like a little bit, uh, it seems a little bit tricky. Okay? If you look from the very beginning, 
to the very end, you'll notice that, hey, I'm still applying the first fundamental theorem of calculus, right? The first fundamental theorem of calculus, which says that you're going to go ahead and cancel the uh, integral and the derivative, and you're just going to go ahead and plug in whatever variable you have into the dummy variable, which is t in this case. But because we have e to the x as our inner function, then that's where e to the x comes in uh, because of the chain rule. So everything that we learned from the first semester is still going to be applied. There. So here, let me try another example just to kind of like, you know, get you to get you a little bit more adjusted. Here, in this case, we have n of x is equal to the integral from 7 to 10 of x uh, of 1 over t dt. If I want to solve for the derivative, n prime of x, then that means, according to what we said, uh, we're just going to go ahead and first, you know, cancel the derivative and the integral to each other. And then go ahead and plug in tan of x for t, for uh, according to FTC number 1. So that's going to be 1 over the tangent of x. Okay, so just doing FTC just by plugging it in. And then we're going to multiply by the derivative of the tangent of x because we have an inner function right there. So our final answer is going to be 1 over the tangent of x multiplied by the derivative of tangent is going to be secant squared of x. So that is going to be our derivative then. All right. Okay, a couple more examples of this and then we're pretty much good to go. Uh, seems like my screen is just all messed up right now, so so I do apologize for that. Okay, uh, let's see. R of x right here. Uh, this time, oh, a little bit trickier because you'll notice that there's a function on the lower part and then there's a function on the upper part. But, you know, it's okay. We can use the properties of the integral to help us solve for this problem. So here's what I'm going to say then. R of x is equal to the integral from x squared to some constant, we'll go ahead and call k, right, uh, of ln of t minus 1 dt, and then plus from k to sine of x of ln of t minus 1 dt, where k is supposed to be a constant. Okay, so it's just some numerical value, so then that way we don't have to deal with um, uh, we basically can have to, uh, in order to use FTC number one, you'll notice that uh, my lower bound has to be some sort of constant, okay? And that's exactly what I'm doing over here. So that's where the K is actually coming from. And actually, you know what, if it helps, let me not write K and let me just go ahead and write A because that's what we've been using for a constant so far. So here's A and then here's A, okay? And where A is going to be our constant. But hey, look what happened. We basically took this problem and split it into two parts. Now we can actually go ahead and solve for this, the derivative. Well, before I do so, though, uh, I don't like how the first part of uh, the, the integral is from x squared to a. I'd rather have it from a to x squared. So according to my properties of the integral, then that means that we can go ahead and flip it so that the integral is from a to x squared and put a negative on the outside, right? And then afterwards, uh, the other part is going to be the same thing from a to sine of x of ln of t minus 1 quantity uh, dt. If I take their derivative now, we can go ahead and apply FTC number 1. So the first piece, that's going to be ln of x squared minus 1, just plugging it in, multiply by 2x because that's the derivative of x squared. And remember, there was a negative on the outside. Plus, for the second part, that's ln of sine of x minus 1 multiplied by cosine of x because that is the derivative of sine of x in the inside. So that right there, that is going to be my r prime then. And that's probably as hard as it actually gets for FTC number 1, the, you know, these type of problems. Okay, here's the final one right here. t of x is equal to the integral from 9 to 5 of sine squared of t dt. This one is actually kind of a trick question because the derivative t prime of x uh, 